Teaching Blast. Technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructorlet.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now, here's a subset of some of the namespaces that you'll be bumping into. Let me just kind of pull out a couple of key ones. System.windows is the root. Inside of there, you'd find, for example, the application and the window class. We have a number of different namespaces that package up different controls, but this is the primary area. This is where you'll find all the controls for menu systems and buttons and list boxes and so on. This guy here is pretty interesting. There are ways to programmatically manipulate XAML. You can load it up, you can save it out at runtime. And that's actually a lot more useful than one might think. You could say, for example, um, you know, you have five XAML files that are describing five different ways the window could look. And maybe when the user clicks on different buttons, you're going to dynamically restyle the layout of the window. Well, you could do that by having this ability to dynamically read in the markup. Now, as an alternative, you can also read in the binary version of XAML. Here's another little goofy term for you, BAML, right? XAML, well, that's what we saw back there in Expression Blend, right? That XML-based grammar. Well, when you compile the actual application, you never have to ship the XAML files. All that markup is going to be condensed down into a binary format called BAML, and it's going to be embedded in your assembly as an application resource. Notice how we have a namespace devoted to that navigationally based application. And believe it or not, this guy right here, this one is going to be probably one of your favorites because this gives you the ability to work with interactive vector graphics, system.windows.shapes. Now, let's think about where that could be so useful, right? Let's say that you want to build a custom control template to completely restyle how the button looks. Now, a template, by the way, if you haven't played around with WPF before, every single control has what is called the default template. And that just means the set of instructions that tell the control look like this by default, right? So the default template of a button, it would just be your traditional gray rectangle. But if you wanted your button to look like a yellow star, you could define a template in markup that defines the boundaries of a star. And you could use, for example, a polygon for that. Right? Well, the cool thing is now is if you want to interact with that polygon, all you have to do is handle normal everyday events, right? So you could handle mouse down, mouse enter, mouse up. And the great thing is, is that the actual WPF subsystem, it's going to go ahead and only fire out these events if your mouse cursor is in the boundary of the polygon, not the large, larger bounding rectangle. So things that used to be really, really hard to do, like hit testing on graphics, is now really, really easy to do. I can maybe just give you a quick little demo on that. Maybe I'll give you a little extra demo too, just to really show you some cool stuff. This is outside of what I normally would talk about in Chapter 1, but what the heck. This is something I talk about in Chapter 3, actually. All right, so remember we have expression. It's a family of products. I'm going to open up this other product here called Expression Design. Now, Expression Design, you know, this is definitely a tool for a graphical artist. You know, this is kind of like Microsoft's version of a Photoshop or an Illustrator. Now, I'll admit readily that I'm not a graphical artist. So I'm just going to pull up a sample. I'm going to grab the teddy bear. So imagine that a graphical artist just put together this image. And you said, hey, you know what? I would love to take that teddy bear and bring it into my WPF program. And I want to interact with it. So maybe if they click on the eyeball, I want the eyeball to spin around in a circle. I'm actually 
resize this. So I can export it a little more cleanly. Right, so there's my little teddy bear. Well, if you don't care about the interactivity, the graphical artist could just export this out as a TIFF or a JPEG or a bitmap and be done with it. But if you want to interact with this thing, you can actually export the image. I can pick export instead of import. Export the image in XAML. So now this is actually extremely compelling. This would allow you to, in, to bring this markup into a WPF program, give names to the objects you want to give names to, then you can drive those things through code or markup. So I'm just going to export this little teddy bear. I'm just going to put it on my desktop so I can find it easily. Notice I picked a WPF canvas. And that's it. Now, let's go to my desktop. So there's my XAML file, right? And I'm going to actually open up this teddy bear in a new expression blend project. So I'm just going to go file new project, WPF application, call it the uh, bear demo. Let's put that on my desktop as well. Now, watch this. I'm going to add an existing item to my project. Let's go back to get the teddy bear. Okay, check it out. Here is the bear in blend. Now remember, this is not just a straight JPEG. All these things are objects. So I could now click on different parts of this bear, right? Like there's the ear, right? Got the nose, part of the mouth. And I can now interact with all these things through code. So this is actually wicked cool, right? So if I wanted to go ahead and say things like, well, if they click on this particular item, I could just come over here. Why well, didn't put it into a code file yet? I can just come over here and handle a mouse event and then do something to that particular item, right? So you can see these are all movable pieces now, right? And I was able to break down this bear into markup. So some really interesting interactions between graphical designers and programmers, right? I mean, how many times have you had some sort of a graphic and you wanted to hit test a certain thing, right? Like if they click on this part of the company logo, I want to animate it with a spinning globe or who knows what you're doing. Well, now that kind of stuff is significantly easier. So a little bit of a tangent there, but I thought that was pretty fun to show you. And so that just really kind of illustrates back what we were saying over here about system.windows.shapes, right? Interactive graphics. Now let's go ahead and come back to the code, right? What I want to do next here is I want to illustrate how you could build a fully functional WPF program without any trace of XAML. You know, strictly speaking, XAML is always optional. If you can describe it in XAML, you can describe it in code, right? Now, most applications are going to have a combination of both, but it's not mandatory. So let's just build a simple window here using the application and the window. Now, the application class, this is just an abstraction of a running WPF program. So you never see this on the screen anywhere, right? He's kind of doing that lower level set of services like routing messages to where they have to go. Um, it's also commonly used as a location to package up global data for the whole application. And it also has a series of events like dispatcher unhandled exception that you can intercept. So here's just kind of a breakdown of some of the core members of the application class. Now remember, you actually subclass application. You're not going to be calling everything statically. There are some static members like current is static, but a majority of all these things here are instance level, right? So again, real quick hit list here. Notice how the application maintains a collection 
of every window currently in memory for that particular application. So it's really simple to do things like, you know, enumerate all the windows and minimize everything. Or find the window with this title and close it. That's pretty simple. Properties. This is where you can package up those global pieces of data that all windows can make use of. You know, maybe it's a connection string. Maybe it's a custom collection of business objects. Maybe it's a blob of XML data. You can just package it up there. And then these three events, those are pretty much going to be handled all the time for every application. Startup, exit, dispatcher, unhandled exception. I'm sure you can guess what you would do inside of startup and exit, right? You know, start up the application and then shut down gracefully. But dispatcher unhandled exception is really, really nice. What this event allows you to do is to catch any exceptions that you did not directly catch through a try catch block. So if some unhandled exception is raised, this is your last chance to deal with it before the user sees that really ugly default error dialog box. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.